Hello, David Snowpick here from Snowpick Games, and this is part 10 in a tutorial series about implementing rollback netcode in a game built with the Godot game engine. Last time, we talked about sound effects and how to play them in a rollback safe way. Today, we're talking about generating random numbers. There's a couple of challenges with random numbers in the context of rollback netcode. One is that you need all peers to generate the same sequence of random numbers deterministically. So for example, if peer one generates three random numbers in a row and gets, let's say, 37, 15, 42, then when peer two generates a sequence of three random numbers, they need to also get 37, 15, 42. Uh, lots of pseudo-random number generation algorithms are deterministic in this way, including the random number generator class from Godot. When given the same seed, it will always generate the same series of numbers. So we're good there. We just need to share the seed with all peers. Another issue is that we need to be able to save and load the current state of the RNG so that we can roll back to an earlier state. This is also supported by Godot's random number generator class via its state property, very appropriately named. So we just need to wire it into the Godot rollback netcode add-on, which is what the network random number generator node from the add-on does. Using it is pretty straightforward. The main difference from Godot's built-in random number generator is that it's a node, because it needs to be, in order for its save state and load state methods to get called by the add-on. So you have to add it to the scene tree somewhere. But those are all the easy, uninteresting challenges. Let's talk about some of the more advanced stuff. So using a single network random number generator, or NRNG, for all the random numbers in your game will likely lead to some pretty big and noticeable artifacts. Why is that? Well, let's say we have a single global NRNG, and it's going to deterministically produce the sequence 127, 733, 419, and 398. Now imagine there's a teleportability that the player can activate, which will move them to a random location. In our example match on tick 37, player one activates the teleportability. So it grabs the next two random numbers from the single global NRNG, those being 127 and 733, and uses them for the X and Y location that the player will teleport to. But on the next tick, tick 38, we find out that we mispredicted, and player two actually activated their teleportability back on tick 35. So the game rolls back to tick 35, and now the first two random numbers, 127 and 733, will get used for player two's teleport destination. And when we re-simulate tick 37, player one will now get uh, 419 and 398 for its teleport destination. From player one's perspective, they will see themselves first teleport to position 127, 733, then a frame later teleport to position 419, 398, and have player two suddenly appear where they just were back at 127, 733. That's a very noticeable artifact. And if you're using random numbers for lots and lots of other things too, if any of those uh, things change during a rollback, it could have ripple effects through the rest of the game. Now, the fix is pretty simple. Use two different NRNGs, one for player one and one for player two. That way, if we mispredict player one, it can't have any effect on player two and vice versa. In fact, you probably should have separate network random number generators for each independent use of random numbers in your game in order to minimize rollback artifacts. But now we have a new problem. <laughs> when we had only one NRNG, we just needed to share a single seed before the match started. Now we have multiple NRNGs, maybe even a dynamic number of them, depending on what happens in the match. And that could mean needing to exchange a ton of seeds, not only at the beginning, but throughout the match. Now there's a clever trick to avoid this. I call it the Johnny Appleseed approach. You have a single mother seed that's exchanged at the beginning of the match that is used by a single NRNG that I call Johnny Appleseed to generate the seeds used by any new NRNG that we need. So long as the order that they are created in is deterministic, then each new NRNG will get the same seed on all peers. And now we can have as many independent streams of random numbers, as many NRNGs as we need. All right. Let's put all of this to use in our demo game and actually implement a teleport ability. So first thing, we need to add some new keys to the input map to trigger the teleport. So we're going to go to project, project settings, input map. We're going to call these new actions player one teleport and player two teleport. We're going to assign the physical key tab to player one 
and the physical key backslash to player two. Now we need to go to our player.gd and in the get local input method, we need to actually detect that that action is just pressed. And if so, set a new key on the input dictionary teleport to true. Now that we've added a new key to our input dictionary, we need to also update our custom message serializer to be able to serialize this new piece of input and send it over the network. So we need to add a new header flag, teleport. It's going to be bit2, because we're using bit flags. And down here in serialize input, we need to actually set the bit flag. So if our teleport key is set, then we set this bit. Now go down to unserialize input and do essentially the same thing, but in reverse, we'll just copy and paste this uh, previous bit of code for dropping bombs since it works essentially the same. We'll just change the uh, header flag to teleport and the key also to teleport. Now we need to go to our player scene, our player.tscn, and add a network random number generator. Let's go back to our player.gd. We're going to add an onready var to grab that uh, nrng. And then we are going to go to our network process and actually use this new piece of input to do the teleport. So if the teleport uh, key on the input dictionary is true, then we're going to set our position to a vector two with a random x position up to 10, uh, 24, which is just the width of our window that we've configured for this project, and a y position up to 600. Now, if we run the project, this should be enough to make this work locally. So we'll go play locally, uh, I can move player one around, I can move player two around. If I hit tab, player one teleports. If I hit backslash, player two teleports. But one thing you may notice, or maybe not because the uh, frame rate of the video is lower than the frame rate of my screen, is that it's actually generating an interpolated frame uh, in between the uh, old position and the new position. We just want it to blink to the new position, but it's actually making up an extra frame as if it were moving there. And that's due to our interpolate state method, uh, which we need to fix to prevent it from doing that interpolation. So we need to add a new variable, teleporting. I'm gonna set it to false by default. And when we actually engage our teleport, we're going to set it to true. And if we are not teleporting, return it to false. This is a new piece of state, so we also need to save it in our save state method and load it in our load state method. All right, and then down here in our interpolate state method, we need to check if teleporting is set on either the old state or the new state, and if so, we don't interpolate. And I'm just gonna copy and paste that. All right. So if old state teleporting is true, or if new state teleporting is true, just return. And if we run this locally again, that should fix our interpolation problem. There we go. So now it's just blinking to the new position without generating that in-between frame. So that works locally. But if we were to try that remotely, it would fail because we aren't exchanging seeds anywhere. So let's get that set up. Let's open up our main.tscn. And we're going to add a new node under the uh, top level main node, a new network random number generator. We're going to name this one Johnny because we're going to implement the uh, Johnny Appleseed approach here. It isn't strictly necessary for our demo game. Uh, we would only have a seed for the server player and a seed for the client player and exchanging two seeds is really not that big of a deal. But this Johnny Appleseed approach I think is necessary in most real games. So we're going to do it here to show how it's done. So let's open up our main.gd. We're going to add a new on ready var for Johnny. Then when one of the players chooses to be the server down here, we need to randomize Johnny, which is uh, generating a new random seed. And then when the peers get connected over here in on network peer connected, we need to have the server send some match setup info to the client. We're going to do that down here where we're setting the message label to starting. We're going to use uh, Godot's uh, high-level multiplayer API to send an RPC. 
we'll call the method that we're calling setup match. In this case, the only thing that we are sending is the seed from Johnny. Uh, but you could imagine that in a real game, you'd send more information about the match. For example, what level you're going to play or what you know configuration settings the uh, host has chosen. But here, we're just going to pass our mother seed, which is Johnny's seed. We call get seed on Johnny. Now we have to actually implement this setup match method, which we're going to do right down here. It's going to be remote sync, uh, which tells Godot that we want to run this function both on the server itself and on the client that is receiving the RPC. It takes this info dictionary, and then we set the seed on Johnny using the mother seed from the dictionary. On the server, of course, this would be setting the seed back to what the seed already was, but that's totally harmless. It's fine. We can, we can let it do that. And then we need to set the seed on the client player's RNG using a random number from Johnny. And we do the same thing for the server player. And assuming we typed all that code correctly, I think that should be everything necessary to get the game working remotely. So let's test it out. This one will be the server. This one down here will be the client. They are getting connected. Now let's just make sure they are connected. I'll move around both players. And now let's activate the teleport. And there we go. Teleporting to the exact same location randomly on both peers. So that's all I have for you today. Please let me know if you have any questions in the comments below or on the Snowpit Games Discord or any of the other places on the internet. Next time, we're going to be talking about more advanced ways to do input prediction. I think I first promised that we'd talk about this back in part two, and now we are finally getting to it. So please subscribe on YouTube, check out snowpetgames.com for a link to the Discord and more information about me and my work. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.